Welcome everyone to episode uh, five of Podcast by Ignite. Five is kind of like a mini milestone, and for a milestone, who better to bring on than newest guest, first time on the podcast, Brian Andrus. Thank you for joining us. Yo, yo, yo. We have spent quite a bit of time on these last two podcasts talking about Call of Duty, and don't worry, we are still going to talk about the trailer, but we're going to kind of focus this one on betting, and so we, we wanted to bring someone in who understands esports, who understands how to bet, how to gamble, uh, and that's that's Brian, of course. And, and on the other side of it, we, we just want someone who knows esports well, who knows all the games we're going to be talking about. So Emmett Dean, thank you for joining us. Anytime. Of course. Uh, so we, I, we can just dive into it, Brian, because I, I want to kind of pick your brain. You know a lot about esports betting. What, what games in particular do you like to bet on? Uh, the one that I love to bet most is, Call of, uh, is the CSGO. Uh, that... For whatever reason, most of the gambling websites has adopted as the main thing that you can bet on. So the way I got into it was it was just available. The When the shutdown happened and they basically took away all of actual sports, uh, gamblers had to move to different things. And one of the things that I found and fell in love with was CSGO. Um, so there's that. There's Dota. There's a little bit of League of Legends. There's a little, like, uh, what are the MOBAs? What are they yeah. called, right? Um, but, yeah, I mean, the, there's definitely a lot of online sports books that are moving towards esports. Um, there's a lot of money to be made and lost in betting on esports. But, yeah. Okay. What was the name of the specific tournament that we were watching and you were betting on today? So, ESL won cologne which is like a major the csgo kind of runs off of like a like a golf or a tennis schedule where they don't really have like a a season and then like a a world championship at the end they have basically majors like us open french open whatever so esl won cologne last year was in a coliseum that had like thirty thousand people in it like it was insane um this year they're doing it online uh, so the price pool is like a lot smaller but yeah, that's the the big one that's going on right now, and it's uh, so like phase. I watch phase versus vitality, um, a few other things. There's North American and Europe that's split up. Normally, if the world was put back together, everybody would be in one uh, one tournament together. But yeah, yeah, I guess they can't play online uh, against Europe versus US because of the ping issues. It would just be way too much for a game like CS:GO where. Even just a little bit of ping is already messing with pros significantly. So that's an interesting issue that they're not able to do that kind of level mm-hmm. of competition. Normally, these things are worldwide, so they're not able to get that same quality of content that they normally produce. Yeah, I hadn't thought because there's professional sports teams uh, in all different sports have limited the amount that they're traveling for those reasons. So you don't want to bring someone uh, normally as you do all around the world into some of these international tournaments because people just are trying not to travel as much so i hadn't thought about that that we're kind of seeing less international play in esports because of this yeah normally they they would run a like a point system throughout the year and so you would qualify for these majors with the amount of points you're getting in the in the the weekly tournaments or the smaller tournaments but uh, the the ping is such an issue the the servers that so for instance in cis which is mostly like russia and smaller countries like like smaller regions like that uh their internet's just not as good and so those teams are kind of struggling it's interesting the, the teams that are usually good that are struggling online versus what they were doing beforehand on, on on land there's different pressure uh, some of the smaller teams are actually doing better because there's not like in-person pressure with thirty thousand people like staring at them that's something we talked about a little bit on our, our last episode of podcast which was momentum in these in these um games okay. and there's definitely something to be said about whether you're in a real sports stadium or an esports stadium surrounded by thirty thousand people watching you right there that level of pressure can help some people excel and also help some people 
fail. Some people will get that stage fright. And they're not going to clutch up in a situation that they should because they have so many eyes watching. And then there's the complete opposite where you're feeling that pressure and it makes you actually play better. And it all depends on the person, you know, these top teams that are playing worse online. I'm sure they have the resources to get the one up, one down internet, the low ping, everything that they need, but maybe they're not feeling that pressure as players to actually perform online because they're just sitting at home, even if they're next to each other, it's just not the same. So, right, and it, it brings into question, like, how good is your organization? Because, like, there, are, it's a very clear difference. Some organizations are actually bringing all of their players in to a boot camp. They've set up uh, basically a studio, and they're they're still being able to play in the same room where the communication is just a little bit better. But not all organizations are invested that heavily into it. Um, some of it, it doesn't matter. It's all of these things are interesting to quantify when you're looking into gambling on it. Because so you take a team like Navi, who supposedly simple is the best CSGO player in the world, right? I mean, he has the highest rating. He, everybody knows simple. And a lot of times the odds are skewed in Navi's favor. In actuality, they haven't been doing good. Like, there's, you can make a lot of money betting against Navi because some of their other players just aren't performing in this non LAN world, whatever that means, you know? I can definitely see that being a thing where fan bases are just betting with the team that they like. They're not necessarily watching everything enough to determine who's going to win and bet on who they think's the winner. It's more, I love this team. I've heard this name because it's a big name. Simple's a huge name. If I was going to blindly bet, you would think you would bet with Navi because Simple's such a huge name. It, previous ex, like previous performance. Problem is that you look at the, the stats and you kind of have to limit it right now to uh, three to six months performance because if you look past that, then simple was doing great at land tournaments where yep. he thrived under pressure not necessarily the case now and so they just play ninjas in pajamas i think uh yesterday and they got just they got destroyed in two maps and it wasn't close so one thing with csgo in particular how often does the underdog win? Is it more or less often than in regular sports betting? Or in esports, is it pretty normal that the, the person who's supposed to win ends up coming out on top? Uh, it's well, it's interesting because there's a, a ban veto, right? There's a map pick. And so you really have to bet on the team with the map that they pick. Um, so... Upsets do happen a lot. Mo most of the time, the better team is going to win. But in like a major that's happening right now, they're all great teams. Um, so it's, it's very close. Um, crazy thing that can happen in CSGO that has kind of frustrated me a little bit in betting is the momentum that we were talking about. It can run away with you. So you can literally bet on a team and they'll be match point and the other team will come back seven rounds to get into overtime, and then they're just shot. Like momentum, it's it's insane. And the way eco works specifically it's in games insane. like CS:GO, you get a couple rounds under your belt, and you can really run away with it. Uh, the other team's forced to save, which is basically gonna throw a whole another round just so they can pull by guns right. to try and stop the momentum. Momentum is a huge thing in games like CS:GO and Valorant, who have similar ecosystems. Phase today were down, so you got to get to 16, right? Um, they were down 15 rounds to, I think, 7. Well, they they won in 15-8. What that actually meant is that, and they got it all the way up to 15-14. Three of those rounds were just pure eco rounds. because So it looked like they were down eight rounds, but in actuality, it's kind of really only like three and a half, four rounds that they're down. Uh, they, they lost 16 to 14, but after being down 15 yeah. to seven, 15 yeah. to eight, I mean, that's incredible. That's a good comeback. I mean, but, but it's a heartbreaker, right? Yeah. You, 
they were on it was on nuke they were on the worst side because it's a very ct sided map they were terrorists so they did a really great job coming back we got all the way back to the 30th round the full distance and then we like and then Zylo just came out and just orped them like just and it was great as a uh, a valorant player and playing a little bit of cs in my day I've been a player in those games where you come back and you go the full round and, you know, a game of Valorant takes you 45 minutes, sometimes longer if you're going the full distance of 25 rounds. And it's like, that is a long game. And for you to come so close to coming back just to lose that last and, round or two, it is the most discouraging it's thing. Oh, it's absolutely heartbreaking. It's just as a player with nothing on the line. But you have 30,000 fans plus watching. I mean, when we were watching it, there was 34,000 people watching this live stream. These teams compete. And for it to go that distance and then for you to lose all of your fans watching, I guess half rooting for you, half sure. uh, against you. But still, that is just absolutely heartbreaking to go the full distance after something like that. Yes, for sure. I, I would say as a player, one of the things that keeps me coming back to the competitive games, though, are those are those games where you end up losing you finally feel like you're mounting some sort of comeback, and then it would happen in Siege all the time. We'd go the distance, lose the last round. Sometimes you end up calling it, you, you, most of the time we'd usually call the night there and stop playing, but every single every single time we'd get off, I just you just want to keep playing. I mean, it's, it's something that's fun about playing it, as well as watching it, is when you have a team that you're rooting for, they're not doing well, they end up starting to kind of come back in, in a game like CSGO, where they play so many rounds, where anything can happen across such a long game, it is so exciting to watch a team make a comeback. And, you know, even if they end up losing, it is still very exciting. When we were very serious in the siege, it was always like a, a play till we lose kind of mentality when we would play at night. And once you would lose, though, and you stop on that game, you try and go to bed afterwards, and all you can think about is like, I wish I had that one round back. That one round wins us the game. And you think about that constantly, and that's what makes you want to come back and play the next day. But uh, that is also a, a fantastic competitive game, a fantastic example of it. Uh, the biggest issue with that compared to games like CSGO and Valorant is the downtime between rounds. It's much slower paced, and you have to think about what you're doing uh, much more. You you have a whole couple minutes between each round. The team's really? repicking characters mm -hmm. and agents with abilities. And you're talking about, okay, we're going to run this strat, we're going to run this strat. And there's a lot more different types of strategy compared to CSGO where, uh, you know, you could run a certain set of agents where you're going to try and run this specific thing. And maybe you've been hiding that the whole tournament and you pull it out in the grand final just to surprise the other team. You have no idea. But that game is definitely a lot of fun. Uh, lots of nights where you just want to have a round back. But you get three wins in a row and then you lose that game, and it's like midnight, one in the morning, you all got work tomorrow, you got to go ahead and call it and go to bed. Absolutely. But. And in a game like Siege, all too often, because it's, it's five on or five on five in Siege, it's been a while yep. since we played, it's all too often, it's just one person lost their one-on-one -on -one or something, and it, it, that happens all the time. And you see it in competitive play just as much. With CSGO, same thing. I mean, it, it's so few people, one life that it usually comes down to just who wins those one-on-one -on -one fights. And I think that that's something that really makes them so incredible. And I imagine specifically for betting on, because there are so, I, and I guess I want to ask you, Brian. Can, hello, everyone. Third time's the charm. We had another uh, accident. So I'm going to ask you again, Brian, uh, and this time hopefully it'll work. You do a lot of sports betting before everything happened with COVID. In your opinion, what has more variables, regular sports or esports? So in real sports, there's giant athletes. There's a ton of different moving parts. There's referees that can make calls. There's injuries that could happen. All that plays into how they set lines, how you bet on a game. Live in-game betting is a lot of what I do. And so all that is way more random than things that happen in CSGO or uh, or a lot of esports, Dota, whatever, that's mainly momentum. So with like CSGO, I kind of know the dynamics of how the game gets played out. So the first round's a pistol round, right? That's, that's very random because everybody has pistols. And then after that, the economy starts working in. And that's just like math, that's numbers. And so you can, if you have the ability to live bet, you can 
bet on the percentages of what's about to happen. So if they win the pistol round, then they're going to start having guns and they're probably going to win like three rounds to start the game off before the other team can even like get into it. So if you have the ability to like live bet cash out even, which is the best thing in the world before the other team starts coming back, then you can start making profit on both sides. So that's a, that's what I like because it's more predictive on what's going to happen. Now there is a team uh, complexity that's become one of the best teams in the world in the online world. And they're the only team in the world that has a, after they lose the pistol round, they have a, a higher percentage of winning the second round than losing it. It's a, it's incredible. So aside from them, you normally know, like in the early rounds, what's going to happen. And then, and then it gets into more of a knowledge base on rifles and stuff. I think what is unpredictable now isn't normally what's unpredictable with esports. So because we're not on LAN, specifically with CDL, just in the champs alone, the amount of disconnects that they have had has been unreal. Yeah. I don't know if that's a big thing in CSGO, but if you drop a person in CDL, you're playing with four for the rest. Oh. So you're you're really? like you're screwed pretty much for that whole map at least. Um, so yeah, uh, that is a big unpredictable thing, specifically with 2020 esports, just because everything's online. Land, that's pretty much never going to happen. Right. Um, if there is, that's like a pretty bad, bad deal, and people are probably going to uh, assume it's getting rigged and all of that because that should never happen on land. Um, but yeah, I, I guess we don't really ever have injuries, right? There's no, no things like that are going to happen. The, the computer is pretty much the ref. Kind so, yeah. So I mean, you're not gonna have stuff like that. And esports didn't really miss a beat going into COVID. I mean, yeah, they did have to move online, but it the world didn't stop. They they kept running tournaments. They kept they evolved into what is now a norm. Um, it's gonna be a lot easier for them to transition back into giant tournaments when the world does come back. Uh, they don't have the um, all the health regulations that you're, you have when you're trying to get 200 people onto a football field. Um, so there's that. I mean, the, there are the travel restrictions, which is a, a separate topic, but it's not as bad as it was. So, um, yeah, I mean, the, the only thing that CSGO does as far as that is, is like, if there's damage done when the round starts, then the other team can kind of and like if if you do damage either way and then somebody drops a server it's kind of on like the other team to no we're gonna play this round up or yeah. or we can say no so that makes sense cdl has a system with this tournament in particular because of 2020 where it was in domination i think one of the first games played someone dropped and it's i think it was if 150 points has been scored you have to continue, but if there are less than 150 mm. points scored, then that game ends, everyone resets, and the match starts anew. So it was super interesting. Um, Rainbow Six Siege actually had basically a season that was all online before COVID, and then their majors and like minor tournaments are in land. But you're going to play your individual matches for your season stats all online because they got teams from everywhere playing, and it's just simpler and cheaper for them to do that. Um, but what would happen if somebody disconnected there is you would basically get a rehost or something like that where that individual round would finish playing out, then they would pause everything, get the other person connected. If that person couldn't connect, then they would have a sub or I've even seen a coach step in, which is wild because right. a coach versus a pro, the coach knows what they're talking about strategically, but mechanically is definitely not there. Wow. So you're still at a disadvantage no matter what if your player permanently disconnects, but you're given a chance. And one round isn't as big of a deal as like a whole map or a whole game. Yeah. Uh, with, well, as a gambler, you don't have any say on what happens. If, if you're live gambling, like I do, um, you're kind of at the mercy of what the book is going to do, okay? So I've seen where, well, they definitely take the bets off where they just black out the bets where you can't do anything. 
but if it's bad enough, they will just cancel all the bets and, and just give you your money back, cancel all the bets and whatever. To your point about the, the, the coach, I have seen a heartbreaker where team came back, got to overtime, He's on a Russian internet and just drops from the server. They're trying to get him back. Can't get him back. So this is in the playoffs of one of a major. And coach definitely had to step in. And it, you know, this go well. to me feel very much like an injury in sports. You don't plan on it. They happen. But it's worse because imagine that, like Auburn was playing Alabama, hmm. okay, in football. <laughs> and imagine – your offensive lineman gets injured and Gus Malzahn himself has to step in and play offensive lineman. Yes. So what I don't understand is why don't these teams have more subs? Because when OGLA lost someone, they had a hard time filling in that fifth spot. So what's what's the reason? I mean, why, why do they not have more people on their second teams or on benches that are ready to step up? I think maybe there's just not enough money there yet. These orgs might just not be built up enough. I think, especially after this year's learning curve, they probably thought, you know, CDL specifically, we're going to be playing in LAN. Why do we need subs? Somebody would have to die, and then we would pick somebody up before we go to LAN. Or something like that would have had to happen for them to need a sub. Uh, but now maybe, the, I mean, they are NFL team owners, so they're probably trying to save a little bit of money. But now they're probably saying, hey, this – is way cheaper for us to run this than the NFL. We can make a ton of money on it. Let's get at least two subs, and then you should be good if you had two subs. And also the orgs themselves with situations like this, I don't know why every organization doesn't have a central place for their whole team to play. You'd think. Yeah, it's the same much way, like organization, in, yeah. Mm -hmm. Gyms and stuff, how you have training centers for sports teams. I think what might end up happening as we see this is how in football or something you might have a practice squad, people that don't dress out for the games, but there's still a large number of people. I think we might start seeing a minor league type scenario in esports where you have, uh, maybe it's a feeder program or just a bench where there's players rotating in and out. And in something competitive like CSGO, where you are only at your prime for so long, maybe it's, it's difficult to get someone to be on a team knowing that they might not play uh, just because of how quickly things kind of move in the esports scene. But I am surprised that we haven't already seen esports kind of move to a system where there are just more people ready to play at any moment. So we have for our for Rainbow Six and for CDL at least they have what's called a Challenger League, which is like the up and coming next generation of pros kind of thing. But it's not like baseball where the Atlanta Phase also own. Atlanta, some different name, and it's like their minor league team. And it's not like that where they're still already playing under the Atlanta Phase organization. It's just this is a completely separate team, only plays Challenger, and it's just those players. So Phase couldn't go pick up somebody from the Challenger League and then have them play right away because they're not signed with Phase. They're not on like the Phase roster kind of a thing. So that might also be an issue because would you rather be a sub on a roster or play for a team on the Challenger League? Maybe that will get restructured to be something more like the like baseball. I feel like that makes more sense, but we'll have to see what they decide. That's a question with everything, though. Do you go and play at a Division One school knowing that you might not get much time or go to a smaller school where you might be the starting quarterback or something? That's uh, true. You know, it's, it's a common problem in all types of sports, for sure. The money thing is interesting right now because... So Navi has Navi Jr. that plays secondary tournaments, the smaller tournaments that Navi would never go to, right? But an interesting thing happened at the beginning of, of COVID and all of this. Australis became the number one team in the world, and one of their major players, like a, one of the cornerstones, uh, Glaive, he just didn't want to do online. They, they won a major. He wanted to take a personal break. So Astralis, knowing this beforehand, like nobody knew he was going to step away, but before, I mean, they did, and they started signing players. So their roster actually had seven players all of a sudden, and nobody knew why. And, they, and it became like a stigma for some reason. Like everybody, the CSGO media, the other teams, they kind of gave Astralis a lot of shit because they, they – had a seven-man roster 
and you don't need a seven man roster and what. So I don't, I, I don't know how much that plays into like the mindset of these organizations. I don't know if that, if they don't have the money for the overhead, uh, the mental aspect and the player break and like being burnt out is a huge factor for a lot of these teams that, but they only have five players. So it's going to happen. I mean, there's so, I feel like there's so many fewer regulations with esports in general right now. If I were an organization owner and I could sign right. uh, as many players as I wanted, I mean, yeah, I might have my, my starting five, but if I saw some kid in Challenger League right now oh, that was no. like absolutely destroying everyone, I would sign him as at least a sub. I would still let him play Challenger League, but I'd be like, come on, like if we need you as a sub, I need you to be ready kind of a thing. Just hop in, even do practices with that team and, and all that kind of stuff. And I don't know why you wouldn't almost have a 10-man roster so your starting five can play against your secondary five and have an even higher quality practice, it feels like, almost a scrim every day. Uh, I'm not sure exactly what these practices look like for these different games. I know right. a lot of it's just individual practice your mechanics and throw your smoke at this pixel and this grenade at this pixel kind of a thing. But uh, there's definitely a lot of teamwork there, too. It's not all just individual play. Yes. With these teams, one thing I'm curious about, and maybe you guys know, do – like Atlanta Face, do they play their? Do they pay their players a salary at all, or how do their players get paid other than tournament winnings or sponsorships? I guess they get paid a salary. They also have individual merch, so I could get an Atlanta Face hoodie that says "Simp" or "BZ" or whatever I wanted on it. Um, and I'm pretty sure that those players, for merch with their name on it, probably also get a kickback. Uh, they also get, especially with an organization like Face. You're gonna get all kinds of brand deals and all mm -hmm. kinds of stuff like that. Are there so, any salary caps in any of these leagues? Does I'm that not exist sure. Yet? Okay. The the most likely one I think that would have a salary cap would be a CDL or an OWL because that's the ones run by NFL owners and they probably are like we have to set a cap on this otherwise some team's gonna spend some ridiculous amount of money on salaries and just yes. destroy everybody for ten years. Um, <laughs> But I'm not sure. Maybe the money's just not there yet. Maybe there isn't a cap and the money's just not quite there yet. But there, that'll eventually be a problem, I think. There's already players getting paid millions per season. So, you know. Yeah, absolutely. And I know a lot of the money for these players comes from outside sponsorships. When you just have someone with a good personality or who is brand recognizable, they get money outside. Definitely. Yeah. So, but so with, with some of the games, it, and I don't no necessarily like what else cdl does other than this uh tournament but the csgo teams the dota teams are just the organizations going to play different tournaments like i don't think there's an overarching organization that would be able to even implement a salary cap mm -hmm. or any regulations like that for the organizations that makes sense yeah. Like, yeah, so I, that's what I'm saying. Australis can sign as many players as they want. They can only play five of them. So uh, yeah, if they got the money to do it, I do know that. So in uh, they're from uh, from Denmark, and it's very hard to find Danish CS:GO players that aren't already under contract. Oh, so there are the, the contracts are ballooning like in real sports. And they're signing up players on these lower teams. So Navi didn't get their first pick because people are getting under contract, regardless if they need them or not right now. So from my research, um, Overwatch League already does this. CDL is likely to do this. Um, they're looking at implementing what they're calling a competitive balance tax. So year one um, payroll cap for your five stack is 1.575 million divided up between five players, uh, which I assume every team is spending. I think it's like it's a couple hundred thousand dollars per player per, for year one. And then after that, basically, if you are spending the most, some of that money you're spending has to be divided up amongst the lesser spending teams. Mm -hmm. So basically, you would be earning money if you spend less from the higher spending teams. They're going to almost have to pay double because they're going to have to pay their players and the other teams, from my understanding. Wow. I got you. <laughs> uh, 
Uh, it, do they have a system in place? Yeah, so that's not like strictly limiting the cap, but that ensures that all of the teams will rise in cap in a similar fashion from what it seems, right? There's not ever going to be a team spending $100 million a year and one team spending $2 million a year. It's going to be all of them will probably stay about the same as they grow. Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. So, Brian, I want to I want to put you on the spot a little bit here. We know, have man. the CDL tournament happen last week, still happening this upcoming mm-hmm. week, and we have two games that are slotted already. So the we first, do. I, I want to kind of ask you about these lines and get your opinion. The first game, Chicago Huntsman versus the London Royal Ravens. Right. Sh- Sh- Chicago Huntsman, negative 180 to win. London Royal Ravens, plus 135 to win. Who who are you picking from those two? Like who who if you're putting money on someone, what are you trying to put the money on? Yeah, so Huntsman just got beat by Phase, right? Atlanta Phase, right? How close was the, the game? It was three to two. Yeah, I mean they they played really well against what the number one team, right? Um, and so that's probably why they're favored here. That I think you gotta go with that so minus 180 is is really really juicy uh was, you have to pay a lot to to win some but i mean that's probably what i would do i'd go 180 um huntsman did just have that close call with the underdog yeah. uh optic gaming oh man that was my t- i thought I that it that went earlier. all the way one on one at the very end o- yep. ogla almost had it yep oh. and so i mean yeah what i saw from that i mean like they're that was really close, right? Very. Uh, defense looked good, though. I mean, I I think that because they pushed phase that hard, that's why the line is where it's at. Um, yeah, you know, I mean, I I think that if you wanted to do that minus 1.5, that's because it's the final four, that's probably pushing it a little bit. Yeah, and, but, and you're talking about playing the spread there, Chicago Huntsman, minus 1.5. Yes. Yep. So, I mean, you're looking at a 3-1 or a 3-0 right there. That's... Two different. For the final four teams. That, you know, I, I'm hoping all of these games go 3-2 the whole way. It would be the most exciting to watch. But, you know, London Royal Ravens, when I was picking, not a team that I put in the final four. So, if I was going to pick a team to go 3-1, 3-0, you know, I would say Chicago Huntsman would do it here. But... After that, I have every game going pretty much the distance. So what I like to do is look at the maps, right? Okay, so um, where is where is the competitive advantage in the map style? So, so map one, we would have a, a hard point, I believe, and then map two would be search and destroy. So looking at the map-specific uh, spreads, you have a pretty dominant uh, Chicago Huntsman in the first map, which would be the hard point, which would be the respawn. Mm-hmm. And then it's actually pretty close for map two in Search and Destroy. Maybe London Royal Ravens have been turning it up in Search and Destroy recently. Okay. Yeah, so I mean, so that's kind of how you you got to look at it. If, if you want to find line value on betting, I think that you just go into the line, look individually at the maps and if Hansen's playing better at search and destroy, well, actually the way that the lines are set up, it would, London looks like it's going to be a much even on search and destroy, right? So if, if they can pull that, that second map and then you can get uh, a line that's better than 180, that's probably what you would do. So if, if Chicago wins the first map, London wins the second map, the who wins is going to be better than 180 right now. And then and then you can probably take Chicago. So big question, yeah. and this is, actually happens quite often in CDL. If London Royal Ravens takes map one and right. map two, are you betting on the Huntsman to go for the reverse sweep and winning the last three Ooh. maps? If so, if they take the f- first two maps you're probably looking at to win the game to win the the series the whole series you're probably going to look at them at like plus 450 probably plus 450 five to one type of a range um 
again, it depends on if you can cash out or not. Because if if you think that Chicago is going to win and they just drop the first map, then that's going to – if they just lost the first map, they're going to go to probably – plus 145 and then that's when you would bet on chicago gotcha brian picks in here if you want more picks from brian join our discord <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah for sure join uh we're gonna put a link for everything in the description below we have a, a room now specifically for uh the betting so you get kind of the insider information w with brian in the discord so game two, which I think, and, and Emmett, you correctly predicted this one, right? Atlanta phase Dallas Empire? No, I oh. had them against Florida, and Florida absolutely uh. whiffed in the champs. They were like the most hyped up team going into this, and they got wrecked in both <laughs> games. So I don't know what happened there. They just absolutely fell apart after being really dominant in the last couple of series. So, But yeah, so we got Dallas Empire and Atlanta phase. Now, if you remember from our previous podcast, Call of Duty expert Luis picks Dallas Empire to win the whole thing. And, and I, so think I think he called these this teams correctly, are... Atlanta phase Dallas Empire. Yeah, so I think we have number one versus number two overall standings. I believe Dallas Empire is number two. This is going to be a heck of a game. Neither of these teams get knocked out after this, so they might end up meeting in the finals as well. So you might get two back-to-back -back games of these teams, which would be crazy. Does one team win them both, or does it go one and one? You know, I'd much rather win the second one when it's for everything yes so yeah brian looking at these and you guys are looking at the the lines right now right who, who you pick and giving those current numbers the the minus 125 for atlanta phase minus 110 for dallas empire so we're saying search and destroy right we're saying atlanta's the best team atlanta's the best team at search and destroy. Uh, search and destroy they're the best team okay so the line right there is minus 125 on the second map okay if if I mean, I would look at the first map, see what happens. And then if you, like, you're going full tilt, that Atlanta's going to win Search and Destroy, right? Then then that's what you do. The interesting thing about Bovada is they have the, uh, the correct scoreline on the bottom. So you can live bet that as well. If Atlanta wins the, the first map, then the 3-0-3-1 is going to look a lot juicier because you think that they're going to win the second map. So, uh, but that's, but just looking at it, that's what 75% profit if you just wanted to bet on Atlanta second map because they're the best team at search and destroy. Absolutely. Yeah. All right. Well, that's good. That's, that's good information. Uh, check out the Discord, like, like Emmett had said, because we're going to kind of keep talking about these. We're all going to get into a little bit of esports betting, which is going to be interesting. Well, thank we'll you. post all of our winners and our losers. <laughs> <laughs> we will. We will do that. So <laughs> many winners. So many losers. Yeah. But it's fun, though. Like, you don't have to always be right. You just want to. <laughs> really bad. <laughs> you know? Yeah. And how long have you been watching esports? Because I would say, I mean, you know what you're doing, especially with CSGO. Uh, how long have you been following that and betting on it specifically? I mean, I really got into it at the beginning of COVID as far as just a gambling perspective. Um, before before I started gambling on it, I was actually really into Mortal Kombat 11. Like, the competitive ESL, like the DreamHack Mortal Kombat 11 tournaments are insane and really, really fun to watch. If you've never watched one on YouTube, they're really, really fun to watch. That sounds awesome. It does. Like it's Mortal Kombat 11 is a really great game. Like it's a, it's they built a beautiful game. It's very, very violent. They just put the Joker in it, um, and yeah, you. Um, I've only ever found one place that you can actually bet on Mortal Kombat 11, but you should bet on Sonic Fox because he's, he's he's the, the best. best. He's the best in the world. So, um, yeah. Yeah, so that that's kind of how I started into just watching, um, and then uh, again the world ended, and the only two things that you could bet on were esports and table tennis. <laughs> and I I bet way too much on both. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
That was pretty good. Don't, don't bet on table tennis. Bad for you. Well, I don't think I'd really ever want to watch table tennis. Outside of maybe the Olympics, I guess, is fun. Oh, nope. he, did, he didn't even watch it. Nope, not even then. You would... Oh, boy. <laughs> <laughs> Well, hey, thank you for your insight. I mean, years of practice. It's good to have you. That's, that's right. Uh, well, but I, at this point, I've probably watched, um, you know, hundreds of hours of, of CSGO and Dota. Um, Dota's crazy to bet on. It's, that, I mean, it's, it's insane. But if you want to make free money, just bet on a secret in Dota because they don't lose. Good they, they don't lose. There's they play team. tomorrow. They don't lose. I'll put it in the title. There it is, folks. That's what you stuck around in the video for. There uh, you so. go. That's the team to pick. Well, that's good. Uh, if we can keep talking, betting, if you guys would like. If not, we have big so COD the, news to talk about. Oh, what's yeah. What's the prize pool for COD? It's like so 4. the whole prize mil. pool? Yeah, for the whole champs is 4.6 mil. The grand prize is a little over 1.5 or something like that, which, if you were paying attention is the salary cap for all five players in one tournament if you come out first place. So that's double your money if you come out first place for the whole year. Pretty good. That's yeah, not it's interesting because we were looking at that. For the ESL one, Cologne, the, the top team in Europe, it only gets $150,000. For the major. For the, yeah, so this is a major. Like this, Again, it's, it's online. They... If it was in the 30,000 uh, seat arena, you know, where they could sell all of the tickets and they could sell all the merch and they can do everything that they normally do, it would be, it would probably be the 1.5 million or something ridiculous like that. But it's interesting to see like how they've had to move forward with just the business side of CSGO versus what. CDL is doing and just the, the massive following that they have with uh, I mean, a lot of young kids, you know. Let's talk about the big release in Call of Duty today. They had their live event announcing Call of Duty Cold War, the next Call of Duty. I know a lot of pros are excited about it. Teams that got kicked out of uh, CDL already, the, the championship. Uh, there's already videos and tweets of them uninstalling Call of Duty Warzone because they're tired of it. The pros didn't like it very much, but they're very excited for Cold War because we're back to, to Treyarch building it. And they, I watched the video of the live event today of them announcing it in Warzone, and it was wild. The whole lobby all of a sudden had to run at Stadium, and then they run at Stadium. They have this awesome Russian translating video going on, and it looks intense. And the, the trailer is almost a little too resembling of the real world right now <laughs> and it's a little scary but it gets you hooked i think it's going to be a great game uh the production quality with call of duty and announcing stuff like this is always fantastic so uh i'm excited about the game i'm probably going to pre-order it because apparently you can get beta access if you pre-order it and that would be good content for my twitch stream yeah, what do you think Jacob? are you going to hop on it early I, I want to one of the things about because i watched it live as well in warzone they took a note from fortnite because when fortnite dropped one of their new seasons they had the same thing anyone could log into the world they've done it a couple of ways they had one where there was essentially a black hole that swallowed the entire old map and then the next season started so call of duty kind of took notes from that with allowing with, and it allowed players to mess around in the world to kind of do these objectives and then to be able to watch the trailer and you unlocked a special gun skin by doing this i w i've seen the trailer a couple times now i am excited and they're not they haven't even really shown off multiplayer there's a little bit at the end of the trailer and we'll put the link in the description if you want to watch it there's a little bit of multiplayer at the end of the trailer but just the single player and i mean it's black ops you, you know this cold war and this is call of duty black ops cold war is the sequel to Black Ops 1. It, it is in the timeline, the, the story mode is going to start right after Black Ops 1. So it's fun that, and who knows what they're going to do with the multiplayer. I'm sure they could go an entirely different direction. But we know that the story at least is picking up where one of the best stories left off. I don't know how closely you were watching, but I was one of the kids that was super into Black Ops, and I pre-ordered the special edition and the whole deal, and I got this limited edition RC car resembling the RCXD, which was an explosive RC car in the game that you would drive and then explode. And I don't know if you saw in the trailer, but it's back. The RCXD has returned. Oh, yeah. The game. 
And I'm just thinking, I can't wait to be running in Call of Duty and get blown up by a random RC car again. I love that little thing because I remember getting it as a kid and I was just like, this is the coolest idea ever. I love this. Yeah, so yeah. I'm really excited to see that return to the game. All of us in the apartment were watching the trailer together and they show it that essentially someone puts it down and it drives under a plane and explodes. All of us lost it. For some <laughs> reason that annoying. Because when you were playing multiplayer, you would hear this high pitched noise kind of come and then boom, you'd blow up and that was it. And it was, it was the most annoying thing. Yeah, you, you, you couldn't <laughs> run away from it. You could have never shoot it or anything. But, it, I mean, we got so excited because we've had Black Ops 2, which kind of went into the future. Black Ops 3 and 4 did the exact same thing. So this one, now we're back. We're, we're back to what feels like Black Ops roots. I, I mean, a game that came out in, what, 2010? When did Black Ops even come out? So it, yeah. it's, it's exciting to kind of feel like a kid again a decade ago just to get to see all of the little Easter eggs that there were in the trailer. And it's kind of an eerie time frame with the, the Black Ops, because especially with Cold War. It's the Cold War era, and it really reinvigorates this United States versus Russia versus the whole world, basically. And it's scary because some days it doesn't feel like it's actually over in real life, right? It always feels like we're in this constant power struggle versus other countries. And their trailer hit home with that. It talks about basically demoralizing a country and talks about the US and all of this. And it honestly feels like right now with the pandemic happening, that that is actually what is happening in the real world. So a game hitting this and based on true events, it even says, you know, they're gonna stretch it a little bit, it's Call of Duty. But it still just hits very close to home, makes it very unsettling. Looks like it's gonna be a fantastic game. Yeah, I'm sure that They've been developing this game for over a year now. It, it was probably storyboarded even before that, long before COVID and everything. So I'm sure just a couple of months ago, they had some developers who, I mean, they had to come out with the game. It was too late to completely change everything, who were going, this is either going to work really well for us that we're making something this close to reality, or we might be in serious trouble making something so so real, so, something that feels like it's, like you said, it's hard to distinguish from reality. Plot twist, Treyarch yeah. actually leaked COVID into the world to help game sales. <laughs> now we're talking. <laughs> it's going to do well. And I'm actually really impressed with, like, they're, they're using this time. They're trying to become the number one game in the world. They're putting a lot of money into ads during the NBA playoffs. They're, and, and the ads that they're running have very famous people, like, in, in there streaming Richard Sherman and just a lot of NFL players like they're they're actively trying to make it this is their way of of bringing in mainstream into their game and they're they're trying to chip away at that Fortnite just cultural appeal that a lot of Fortnite has Fortnite's got their issues going on right now and so there's a huge opportunity to probably put themselves in the forefront like Fortnite's been doing for the past, what, three, four years, right? Yeah. Call of Duty has the, the team for it, and they've been doing a lot right. I mean, with this Call of Duty, it was the first time with cross-play. We've talked about this before. That's a big deal. There might be zombies in this game. I could totally see it happening. Bringing that back is going to be a huge deal. I, I will say, just quickly interject, while there was nothing in the trailer, the description on the video does say that they are bringing back zombies. So, so there you go. So we, we know for Zombies sure. Back. And they say Warzone is here to stay, which will probably get modified to hold the, the Cold War theme as well. So you're going to have a Battle Royale, your traditional Call of Duty game. You're going to have Zombies, and it's all going to be cross-play for the first time ever. It's going to be a ridiculously best-selling game. It's probably going to go down in the history books. I think so. And Call of Duty had... For a few years now, they had been struggling. Their sales were still doing okay, but not as well as they were. They had actually kind of declined in, in a couple years before this. Modern Warfare did very well. Warzone did even better with the number of players it was able to get into the game. I, it's probably too soon to say, but I, I'm almost willing to say at this point that Call of Duty might be back to form with this game. I, I think we might be seeing the return of Call of Duty. And I think that they could be back in full force with you know, what's a better name than Black Ops. I, I still think Black Ops 2 is the best-selling Call of Duty game. It might have been Modern Warfare 3. It was one of the two, but either way, one of the best-selling games was Black Ops 2. And, I mean, they're doing it again. They're Like you said, they're changing on a few things, like Warzone, but they're keeping it in. They know that they need zombies. They know they need a good multiplayer. I, I really think Call of Duty might be back with this one. 
if they can go above and beyond in every segment and not slack in any of the segments, then they're going to do really well. Like CDL, the players weren't a big fan of this Call of Duty. They didn't feel like it was getting balanced or ran very well. So as long as the competitive, because that was something that was great in Black Ops 2, if the competitive scene is there, the Battle Royale scene is there, the zombies is better than ever, which I can only imagine what they're going to do in zombies. Now, I remember playing the original one, which was like three rooms, and running around that for 50-plus rounds, getting a ray gun. And now they have you know vehicles, and you have all these Easter eggs, and it's just absolutely insane what they're doing with zombies now. So, Nazis? Do we yeah. get Nazis again? Yeah, I don't know if they'll bring back Nazis or not. I imagine they're, if we're doing Cold War, they're already kind of painting crazy. Russia or the Soviet Union, I, I guess, as kind of the antagonist here. So I imagine we might be seeing something more like that, like early era Soviet. I believe the original reason they the the original reason they got rid of Nazis was because there were some political issues with it at the time. They they got in a little bit of trouble for showing yeah. the swastika in their game, yes. which there was a huge debate about that. And I think actually with the last one that they did World War Two with. There's not a single swastika in the whole game. They used a different symbol to depict the Russians. Correct. Um, but in World at War, it was definitely everywhere. I remember playing the campaign in that and bringing down the flag in Berlin and putting up the American flag. I mean, it's very iconic games. They're the multiplayer and the campaigns and everything have been iconic in Call of Duty throughout the years. Yeah, the multiplayer in Call of Duty Modern Warfare, the most recent one, it wasn't too political. But the story mode, quite famously, was very political in the most recent Call of Duty. Uh, and I, we're probably, just judging by the trailer, we might be seeing something very similar, where we get a single player in Black Ops that is very political, or they're taking at least some sort of stance, and a multiplayer that maybe is uh, a more serious, and then they save Warzone for being kind of the cosmetic, we can change a lot, we can iterate on it, so they have options. I mean, at this point, uh, multiplayer, story, zombies, and Warzone, they're basically producing four different major products that they can kind of modulate and make however they want to and they're still keeping with call of duty mobile as well let's not forget that that was big for a little while and in-app purchases are a huge revenue stream as well so they got games on every platform now and everyone's pretty much able to play together which is very unique for a triple a title it's uh they're kind of pioneering that uh fortnite did it a little bit but it wasn't as serious i feel like as call of duty is yeah it's a little different between the two well uh, now we can put that in the title because that's probably the most clickbaity thing we have this week, so that's good. I do want to talk about the podcast question of the week because we had quite a lot of good answers. This week's question was just what which esports game is best? What game is the best for esports? Um, and so one of the questions, or, or what you said, Emmett, and I kind of want to uh, talk to you about it. So you said hard to argue against League of Legends. They tripled the viewership of the Super Bowl. And this is something that a lot of people don't know. I was actually talking just the other day, how big esports is. So why, why League of Legends? This is always the one that we use like as an example to validate like esports is here, right? Esports is a legitimate market. To have for one single grand final that many views compared to a normal mainstream sport that, you know, the Super Bowl weekend's a big deal in the United States, right? Everyone's going to Super Bowl parties, getting together, watching it. And this tripled the viewership. Maybe not out of the United States, but the whole world. It's more of a, a worldwide event. But, I mean, that amount of viewerships, no matter what, the advertising dollars and everything is huge. And it's not even being, it's not fully saturated yet. Every advertiser that decided to advertise on that grand final was like the best bang for their buck probably in their entire career of advertising. Because no one is taking the leap yet. Companies are starting to, like... We were watching the CSGO recently or today and DHL, the shipping company, was advertising mm -hmm. an ESL That's clone. Huge. It's like that is a very strange uh, <laughs> advertiser. Normally we're seeing stuff like G Fuel, Mountain Dew, uh, Logitech, Corsair, like normally gaming centric companies. Mm -hmm. You're even getting a little bit of Chipotle, some cash app now who want to get in this market, uh, which is awesome. But yeah, I mean, you you know, you're starting to see advertisers just realize like, hey, we don't we don't care who we're in front of if it's related to our brand or not. This is just the cheapest eyes right now, and that is legit. And um, you know, we're building some stuff along those lines as well for our first product at Ignite. So it'll be exciting to announce that super soon. Um, and yeah, 
Yeah, that's a good point. One of the things I think is it's just cost per impressions to, to put something in, into this. It's a lot cheaper, whereas you're not paying, you know, famously the million dollars for a 30 second long Super Bowl ad. It is a exactly. lot cheaper to get it in front of uh, the worldwide stage in something like League of Legends. And I think that that's why we see uh, we see it set the way it is. That's why it's so massive, for sure. And then, Brian, I, you like betting on CSGO, but what, what esports yeah. scene is your favorite? Um, my f- my favorite is probably CSGO uh, because it mirrors real sports the most, in my opinion. So there's I like offense versus defense. I like that it's quick. It has rounds, so you can stop in between each of them, but it is quick. Um, it Theoretically, unless there's overtime, a map will only take an hour. So you know how long you're locked into a certain amount of time. And I, I've actually really enjoyed like learning the players, learning the teams, learning the rivalries in between that because this game's been around for 10 plus years and there's there's a lot of history and and because of it, the production companies are actually able to make like really cool videos about the history. All that stuff is like I've always been into. Uh, the the entrance of the team just as much as the team's playing type of a type nothing of a thing. beats a good hype video you nothing know like beats it. just like the pregame and I think that CS:GO the the ESL and the organizations around that do extremely well with the production value of of what they're trying to do and so like the set that we were looking at today in actuality it's a just a giant green screen but they made it look really really great uh, uh, just as good as any of the pregame NFL shows that you see. Um, and so, yeah, so like the three main sponsors, Intel, you expect to be there. G Fuel, you expect to be there. DHL, they've got some German guy up there asking a question each map um, just to shove DHL down your throat, and I ain't mad at it, you know? Um, one thing I, it, that is interesting, uh, I really do enjoy watching Dota. I don't exactly understand a lot of what I'm watching, uh, other than I know when someone gets killed. But every single giant uh, Dota match in the bottom right, you will see the Mercedes Benz logo. Oh. They, it's there. I don't know how much they're paying for it, but Mercedes Benz is sponsoring Dota, and Dota actually has the biggest prize pool of any esports game in the world. I wonder yeah, why. Dota is huge. Dota is huge. Dota, they took League of Legends and I think they, they just they put better graphics cards behind it and they they made the the heroes just look a little bit sexier and like, <laughs> and that has the biggest prize pool money that you can make in esports. So that's a that's a competitor i'd say real quick it's interesting if you go back in time a little bit the the biggest esport really used to be starcraft Mm -hmm. which was a real-time strategy game and that was extremely competitive huge prize pools but that whole rts category has almost completely disappeared from esports it'll be interesting to see if they would come back there was a starcraft 2 did not hit the same as starcraft 1 but uh it'll be interesting to see if anyone tries to make a game like that and bring it back maybe Uh, there's a need for it i'm sure yeah. yeah, I had said Rocket League, and I'd recommend if you don't watch Rocket League tournaments, it is incredible. It, with some games, they don't work too well as in esports. Rocket League, I think, works perfectly. You have camera angles that can kind of follow around. It's all in one stadium, so it's very easy to kind of look at players individually while still keeping an eye. It's similar to football almost, where you can kind of bring different cameras in and out to look at the field at different levels. I love the players. It's three-on-three tournaments. Most of the time, they're three-on-three tournaments, so it's even more intimate than some other games. They're exciting just because of the nature of it. That It's five-minute-long games, and they play several of them, depending on the series. So, it, I mean, it's just very quick, where sometimes it comes down to... And there's overtime if the teams are tied, so sometimes it just comes down to something as exciting as that. I love watching Rocket League. That's actually what got me into the game was before there was really a Rocket League esports scene or anything, there were tournaments going on when the game came out on PlayStation. And I loved watching it so much that I, I just had to buy it, and now I play it all the time. 
And for anyone who doesn't watch it, it's not as big as many. They're really the viewership isn't nearly as high as as like you guys said, Dota or League or something like that. But just watching it for fun because the games are so quick and, and it is just it's so tight and fast. But it it's easy to watch. You don't really have to like you said with Dota where you might not really know everything that's going on. Rocket League is very easy to watch and understand. It's just cars hitting a ball trying to score into a goal. And I, I'd, I'd recommend it. I know not many people watch it, but I absolutely love watching Rocket League. I've heard uh, that you're pretty highly ranked in Rocket League. When are you getting picked up by a pro team? Just at Champion, which about two years ago would have meant I prob- I could have maybe tried something. Nowadays, Champion means about as much as Silver does in Siege. So <laughs> probably no time soon. I actually I took a break. I told myself this most recent summer that I was going to hit Champion and Rocket League. And I thought it was going to take me all summer. I hit it just about one week after class is finished. <laughs> so I just stopped playing Rocket League. I said, all right, I've done it. I, you know, I did the thing that I thought was going to take me a while, hitting champion, which is kind of a big deal. I, I haven't really played that much in the last couple months, especially with Modern Warfare. I've been playing a lot of Modern Warfare. So, What's your favorite map on Rocket League? Like I, which game? There are some that I skip. The okay. I don't even know what they're called. The Aquarium level is one I always skip. I think it's the Coliseum is what it's called. That's and that's one of those matches that's almost always used in Rocket League esports. It's one of the maps that cycles through. That one's probably my favorite. I, I don't know. There are just a few that I really don't like, but I don't have any favorites really. One mechanic from Rocket League that I love that I've seen in a couple clips that's pretty funny is the match doesn't actually end until the ball hits the ground. So in the last round. So as long as the ball is in the air, it doesn't end, which gives the team an opportunity to score even after the clock's over. But I saw this clip where these pro players... (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. I've seen these pro players be able to balance the ball on their car while they drive around basically infinitely and then even pass it to each other, just keeping it up. And it was like 5-0 to the other team. The other team could score and not matter. But just the fact that it continues going and continues going, it's pretty entertaining. One of the greatest moments in Rocket League, and this was one of the first real tournaments that they had, the a team was down two points, and a guy named AC was his name. They scored with just about five seconds left on the clock, so now they were down by one. He was able to do exactly that. He, he choke it up on the wall, and at that point, in the beginning of Rocket League, all the players were still kind of learning how it worked. So what he did at the time was pretty simple. Now, even I can do it. But when he did it, no one had ever done it before. And he took it up the wall and basically played a ball off of the roof so that way it didn't touch the ground. Never, it was one of the most iconic moments in Rocket League by AC. And they did that. They took it into overtime and then they eventually won the game. And I think yeah. it ended up being 10 seconds past when the clock hit zero because the ball never touched the ground. And it's, I, that's one of the, it, I would say when you play, you, if you play 10 games in a night, you're going to have a couple that go to that 0-0, zero, zero, can someone score just yeah, at the very end of the game. I love playing Rocket League. Uh, watch our content. Come to the Discord. Well, I'll say it again. Well, put a li- <laughs> link in the YouTube description everywhere. In Discord, we have Rocket League. If you ever want to play with me, with any of us, we might try and, well, a few of us do play Rocket League. So to hop in the Discord. And then real quick, I want to read podcast question of the week. Hop over onto our Instagram or Twitter, IGNTE.GG. We had a few other answers. One is from Luis, who has been on the podcast a few times. He said Call of Duty League, and we've talked about that. Call of Duty League, their production quality is so high. Uh, We had Overwatch was one that was said. CSGO was said. And then Sea of Thieves. uh, There is no esports scene for Sea of Thieves, so thank you, Kayla, for that one. (laughs) <laughs> uh, but yeah so thank you for commenting on the instagram but we're doing well on time i mean this one's actually we're running well, pretty long because we I, that's that's what i wanted we wanted that 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 betting information from you brian uh nope. but if you guys don't really have anything else to talk about we can call it yeah sure all right. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. Episode five. Uh, like we said, check in the description for all of our socials, the website. We have a lot that we're working on. And, you know, thank you for joining us. Thank you for kind of sticking a- around. We actually just broke about two. When I checked, we were at 220 something viewers across YouTube and our podcast. So thank you, everyone who's who's watched these episodes. Uh, thank you guys for joining me and uh, goodbye. <laughs>